Hello and welcome to The Way I Work, a podcast about how people get work done, brought to you by Rigby, a staffing and services company based in Zurich, Switzerland. If you are looking to hire or to be hired in the Zurich area, let us know. You can do so either at rigby.ch forward slash apply or by checking out some of the requirements that we currently have open at opportunities.rigby.ch. This is episode one of The Way I Work podcast. This is Daniel from Rigby in Zurich, and joining us today is someone that we've admired for a long time now, Raoul Powell. Raoul is the co-founder and CEO of Real Vision, a fast-growing, disruptive financial media company. As well as doing that, he's also the author of the popular investment newsletter, Global Macro Investor. In his life before GMI and Real Vision, Raoul co-managed the Global Macro Fund in London for GLG Partners, one of the largest hedge fund groups in the world. Raoul moved to GLG from Goldman Sachs, where he co-managed the hedge fund sales business in equities and equity derivatives in Europe, a role which he started while he was still just in his 20s. Raoul retired from managing client money at the age of 36 in 2004. He moved to Spain and went into semi-retirement before re-emerging to start up Real Vision in June 2014 with three partners. Raoul now lives in the tiny Caribbean island of Little Cayman, but, when not under lockdown, spends a lot of time on the road visiting the company's offices in New York and the UK, among other places. Clearly, this is someone who gets a lot into his day. Join me as I try to learn a little bit more about how he does it. Hi Raoul, thanks for joining us. How's it going? Yeah, great, thank you. All right, good to hear that. Raoul, if it's okay with you, I think we'll just jump straight into it. In a recent video you recorded, I think with Ash Bennington, you briefly turned the camera around to show us your workspace there in the Cayman Islands. I I always find that kind of thing so interesting, that glimpse behind the curtain to see how people set things up to get work done. If it's okay with you, that's what we'd like to learn a little bit more about today. Of course. All right. But first of all, can we go all the way back to your very first experiences of work? Uh, Did you ever clean cars or have a paper round or wash windows or anything like that? Yes, I my. First proper job. I mean, I, I, used to, I used to wash cars and stuff, but, um, and I'd earn my pocket money from my parents at home by mowing the lawn and clearing up the dog mess from the garden. That was you know, so all that kind of stuff. And then my first kind of summer job was working at the local pub where I was washing glasses because I was still 14 years old or whatever. But I'd earn a bit of extra money doing that. Um, and then by the time I was 15, I was working at a petrol station. Because, again, my dad just, you know, we were, you know, middle class, reasonably well-off family. But, you know, dad was very much of the opinion that you had to learn about work. And so the idea behind that was, you know, so I went to work in a petrol station. Very egalitarian. There was me serving, you know, s- serving gas at the pumps. It was a local village station. And, you know, we knew who the owners were and stuff. But it was a, just a small place. And I washed their cars and, you know, sorted out gas bottles and stuff like that. So those are my first jobs. I've also packed beef burgers, frozen beef burgers, which was the worst job I've ever had. I lasted three days and gave that up. Um, and I've done, yeah, just all sorts of stuff. Um, and I've never been afraid of that. And then one summer, my father had his birthday and a good friend of his who I knew well, didn't know what he did because I was now at this point 19. I was at university first year first summer after the university, um, after my first year at university. And he said, oh, Ralph, he's an English guy. He's like, uh, his wife's American. He said, oh, when are you come out to New York for the summer? I'm like, well, how am I going to do that? I said, cheekily, I said, unless you obviously, unless you can give me a job. He said, sure, and I'll lend you an apartment as well. Um, so he happened to own, or not own, he was the um, president of a company called Tellerate, Tellerate's the Bloomberg of the time. So if you see the film Wall Street, those are Tellerate screens you see. So it was the financial information services industry. His office was on the 104th floor of the World Trade Center. And he lent me an apartment, a small one bed kind of studio apartment on the Upper East Side that he used as his kind of pied terre because he lived out in Greenwich, Connecticut. And so there was me as a 19 year old in New York. Oddly enough, a bunch of my friends who were at university happened to be in New York that summer. And, um, and that was it. I was smitten. So you even had people to hang around with at yeah. the weekend. And I would just go out and meet people on my own. You know, America is a very friendly place generally, particularly if you've got an English accent. So it was it, it was great. 
Okay. So was it that experience that got you set on this path then? Yeah. So after university, I graduated in 1990, which was a recession. And I, again, speaking to one of my dad's friends, he said, Ralph, what are you going to do after university? My father was in marketing. So he came from marketing at Xerox and had been in marketing. And then he was a management consultant and headhunter. And he, and this friend of my father said, so what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm kind of toying between marketing because I like it or the city because I like finance. And it, you know, it was the whole era of people driving red Porsches and, you know, the whole kind of Wall Street era. And the guy looked at me and gave me the best piece of advice I've ever had in my career. He said, simply put, Ralph, he goes, you can go and work for Mars, which is a fantastic consumer marketing company, and they'll give you free Mars bars. Or you can go and work for a bank and get free money. And so I, I applied for, yeah, and I applied for both sets of jobs and got rejected from every single one. I went to a pretty crappy university. I came out with a 2-1, which is pretty decent in economics and law, but it was the only university that accepted me because I discovered girls and cars and the pub and all of those things before university and kind of flunked a lot. Um, but I managed to get myself in because I'd worked that summer at Tellerate. I managed to get myself a job um, at, in the graduate training program at Tellerate. After I've got, I mean, I've still got them. I've got 120 rejection letters of all the jobs that nobody wanted me for. So this is the job that I took. And I was to be doing customer support for a product called Teletrack, which was a technical analysis product. So I didn't know anything about tele technical analysis, so I had to learn. And then before you knew it, I was training people in technical analysis, and then I got, a, then I got promoted, I became a salesman, um, um, changed sales roles, and then eventually got a job at James Capel, part of HSBC. Uh, okay, because sometimes if you look at high achievers, it would be easy to assume that they've benefited from some kind of guiding hand, someone that was opening doors for them or introducing them to people. But it sounds like you said you had 120 rejection letters and you had to go through a few different roles before you settled. Well, partly, look, I must admit, my, you know, my father did help me in that way. But, you know, I'd learned, my dad had done something really clever when I was young. He made us, when they were having, they were very sociable. And so when they were having a party, the kids, myself and my sister, would serve drinks, serve snacks. And so we grew up in conversations around these people. And because my father was a um, um, management consultant, we had a lot of interesting people who come to the house. And so you learn how to talk to them. You learn how to speak to people without being fearful, understanding what your place is within the conversation and how to connect with people who are far more senior than yourself, but in a relaxed manner. So that taught me a lot. So that allowed me to grasp an opportunity when I saw it, because I kind of had learned how to behave uh, and you know, how, how to win people over. Right. And that's something that serves you even today. Raul, just sticking with your family for a second, I know you said that your dad was from India, that your mum's Dutch, but that you grew up in the UK. Whereabouts, Raul? Were you somewhere near London? Or? I, so my parents met on a blind date in Birmingham. My mother was a Dutch au pair. My father was a student at university. Um, and um, they met in Birmingham. So I was born in Birmingham, which is something I don't discuss publicly. Um, and... My father was at Xerox then, where he was like a regional sales manager or something at the time. And then he ran um, the north of England for Xerox. And so we lived in Liverpool. So I lived in Liverpool for all, uh, about four years. Um, and then we moved down to Berkshire, to the Maidenhead in Berkshire, because dad had by that point become the marketing director for Xerox for Europe. Um, and so I was living in, in uh, just outside London, 30 miles outside London. And do you miss it? Do you ever get homesick? Uh, of England, I miss my friends, obviously. I mean, I'm really lucky. I have a big group of friends and we all grew up together. So I've still got friends that I've had from the age of six. So it was a really nice thing. So I miss my friends. I never forget, I was living in Spain. I'd left England for about five years. And I was feeling a little bit homesick to England. And I went back to a friend's wedding and it was in Henley. And it was one of those perfect English summer's days. And you could hear the kind of creek splat of the rowers, that smell of cut grass, and, it, and the kind of hubbub outside the pub as people were drinking pints. And I just thought, you know, maybe, maybe I could come back. The next day, it was raining sideways. Everybody was miserable. I'm like, no, I'm never going back. So, no, I don't, I don't miss it for that. I miss, 
you know, I go back frequently, obviously not this year, but I go back frequently and, and, and that's enough for me. I'm more homesick for Spain, I think, where I lived for 10 years. And looking back at those early days of your career, is there anything that you would do differently if you could do it all over again? No. No. I'm not a man of regrets. Um, I've never had any, anything with my career go wrong. Um, yeah, there's always points in your career that are stressful. No, I, I was really lucky in the opportunities that I got given. And it's not just a, it's not about my own personal abilities. It's about luck as well. And I had luck. And so I, I, wouldn't, have, I, wouldn't, have changed, I wouldn't have changed any of it. Are there any tips that you would have for someone starting out in your field now? Don't. I wouldn't start. I mean, I wouldn't start in finance now. I know many people are still desperate to because it's interesting, but I think the financial world is shrinking. The new financial world of cryptocurrency stuff is growing. Technology is growing. You know, the use of data is growing. There's industries with tailwinds, but to be in the financial services industry is like being in the oil industry. You know, it's 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 a shrinking. You've got a headwind now. It's an incredible business and it's really rewarding and intellectually challenging. But I think it depends what you want to do. I've always found the people who do best in that industry are not necessarily the smartest. I found there's three types of people in that industry, four types. There's the ultra super smart, um, you know, that have come out with two PhDs from some Russian university and they end up with a great career in, in the technology side or the derivative side. There's the smart kids who only ever wanted to work on Wall Street and went to Harvard and Oxford and INSEAD. And do, those guys tend to work all their summer jobs in banks. They tend to be identikit. They wear the same clothing. They do the same things. They hold it in the same place with the same people. I found generally those people weren't great. Even though on paper, you'd imagine they'd be formidable, they ended up with middling careers. It's the people who had either street smarts or more powerfully, intelligence, street smarts, and character. So when I would hire people at Goldman, I'd get all these CVs of all these identikit wannabe investment bankers. I didn't want any of them because they're all the same and they didn't have character so I would look for the people who had character. So, you know, one of the guys I hired, it was a great success. I saw on his CV, he was at Oxford. Um, or was it Cambridge? I think it was at Oxford. And he had organized the British University's ski competitions and ran the social committee and was a rugby player. And out of that, you kind of knew that he got on with people. He could organize complex things and be unflappable under pressure. Um, and that, you know, he was just a sociable person so he's got charisma so here's a smart guy with charisma who likes competing chances are he's going to do well so i always think of that then the other thing is teach yourself learn more than others and learn what suits you i'm a very visual person so charts suit me other people are very data driven so spreadsheet sheets suit them find out what suits you and then use your abilities and corral them to make the best of them do you have a typical work day well my work days have changed over the years as i um started real vision because i was living in spain writing global macro investor which is a monthly publication of about 100 to 130 pages and i would spend a bit of time looking at financial markets answer emails but really it was just monitoring what's going on and then i would spend one weekend a month writing this huge amount of stuff that was a really easy life, maybe too easy. Then I started Real Vision and everything changed because I had to be financial markets and I needed to be an entrepreneur and a CEO. And so I don't have enough hours in the day any longer. Um, and that's been a hard journey of six years. Currently now within COVID, it's the worst because I wake up early. You know, I got broken by the finance world, so I can't sleep in. Because at you know, Goldman, I was at my desk by quarter past six. So here I am. I wake up at five. I get up, grab a coffee, go to my computer, check my emails, check the financial markets, check Twitter, check the FT, you know, that kind of stuff. So, so from five o'clock, I'm at my desk. Then I might go and do something else, you know, do either yoga or some activity or take dogs for a walk, whatever. And then I'm back at my desk again 
And I'm basically at my desk monitoring, again, all of the inputs. And it's a bit overwhelming when markets are moving really fast. It becomes really overwhelming because I've got GMI clients who want attention about what's going on. There's a lot going on in the market. There's always a lot going on in Real Vision. You know, there's 50, 60 people at Real Vision in various countries around the world. So my diary is, I don't know, 12 meetings a day. Um, so I'm probably still doing 14 hour days at the moment um, and probably half the weekend. And it's been like that pretty much for six years. Ah, that was my next question. You've already answered it. Do you make time for a proper weekend to switch off? You know, no. And that pisses me off a bit. I, I write for one weekend a month. So that's a whole weekend for a woman investor. Yeah. So that leaves me three weekends a month. When pre-COVID days, I'd probably be coming back from New York because I've been in the New York office or whatever. So I'd probably miss some of Saturday or if I got back on Friday night, you know, there was invariably something I had to catch up with because I've been out of the office. So even though I live in the Caribbean and I should be enjoying it more, I don't get enough time. But now a little Cayman, because just outside my window, I'm right on the beach here. It's easier to do so um, on the weekend, but I still, you know, my mind's always active. So, you know, I kind of enjoy a bit of thoughts time on the weekend to write something or, or to look at something. Um, but I'm not, you know, I should be diving every weekend and I'm not doing it and I'm not doing, you know, some of the things I should be doing. You know, people keep saying, come out fishing for tuna. I'm like, I haven't got time. Um, so yeah, not making the most of it really. Um, but I kind of figure, you have times and phases in life. And this is my phase to work as hard as possible for the objectives that I've got. Uh, and there are other times, like when I was living in Spain, that it wasn't necessary. And so it's okay. you know. And it's fun because I quite like living on adrenaline, so I don't mind doing that. But extended periods of living on adrenaline burn you out. So you have to be very careful of that. Raoul, a couple of months ago in GMI, you wrote about keto magic. Is that something that you've been sticking with? I have. I've ended up, you know, I've always been a pretty healthy eater. Um, I was, I, I, in my early 20s, I put on a lot of weight, then I lost it. And I kind of varied around. I was never slim. You know, my father's not slim. It's a typical kind of northern Indian attribute. But then I lived in Spain and we grew everything, all of our fruit and vegetables. I mean, just we grew, I don't know, 50 different crops. I mean, it's incredible. I was really lucky. So everything was natural and fresh. I've always been a healthy eater. But then I kind of discovered keto because of listening to Tim Ferriss podcasts and thinking, oh, maybe that's a that's an interesting way of not gaining weight as you get older. So I tried it and it's like bloody magic. I mean, you're not hungry. You're eating plenty. In fact, it's actually sometimes too much protein and you lose weight. And then you don't put on weight. And so, and sure, you can have, you know, like I'm, I'm going out for uh, uh, lunch tomorrow with friends and I won't eat keto. But yes, it takes a few days to get your body back into keto again. But that's kept actually over time, as opposed to, you know, I'm 52 years old now. Normally you'd be putting on just naturally a few pounds a year, even if you're pretty well behaved. I'm finding the opposite. I'm kind of losing three or four pounds every six months just by maintaining a keto. So it's been good. And it gives you a lot of energy and it gives you some sort of discipline and structure. And I've found, you know, I've lived my life two ways, one without discipline and structure and one with discipline and structure. And I'm finding it's rewarding to have some discipline because it gives you, you know, a way of doing things. And I'm not super disciplined. You know, some people won't drink on keto. I refuse to do that. Um, you know, I just do it within reason and it just, it works well for me. It's really, it's really good. Uh, uh, you know, that's been a magic. And the other thing that I'm the strongest proponent of is vitamin D. You know, it's a, that is the wonder drug. Getting out in the sunshine, you mean, not as a supplement. Getting out in the sunshine, not as a supplement. Natural vitamin D in, you know, reasonable amounts. So I will spend on the weekend, I'll spend an hour, an hour or two a day in the sun. So I don't get too much. I try not to get burnt. I don't spend all day out in the sun. And, you know, it's one of the things that they've identified as one of the key driving factors for longevity of life. 
And, you know, there's extraordinary statistics about how even things like Spanish, Greek, um, Japanese smokers, for example, are basically immortal, while Russian smokers and others who smoke at the same rate die extremely young. And one of the things is they think that <coughs> vitamin D has a huge impact on the pulmonary system, which they don't yet fully understand. Meaning, it's obviously a very key influence of why these nations who are in the top five smoking nations of the world don't seem to die in the same rates. Okay, so vitamin D and keto. Uh, talking of keto, I know that before the coronavirus outbreak, P.D. Mangum was supposed to attend a Real Vision event. That guy's amazing. He's 65, but he doesn't look a day older than 45. No, oh, and I only came across him you know, a while ago on Twitter because he happened to be a Real Vision follower. He's a Real Vision subscriber. And so we just met, and, you know, because I'm interested in the keto stuff. And his basic principle is, is generally keto style, so protein-heavy, low-carbohydrate diet, lift some weights, walk a bit, and um, get some sunshine. And, you know, it's, it's simple things that can really help drive quality of life. Yeah, and I don't think he's suggesting that people should work out every day. It might only be two to three times a week, right? That's right. That's right. It's just about um, getting your body under stress. So some people use fasting for that as another method, but put your body under stress and your body reacts well because it, it learns to cope. So if you put it under stress of using weights, then you build muscle mass. If you build muscle mass, you tend to um, age slower because one of the things that happens is your muscles atrophy over time. So it keeps you fitter. Also, they've now figured out after all the years of gym rats being on treadmills, they've actually figured out that weight training actually burns more calories because the effects last longer. And the more you do, um, in terms of the larger your muscles grow over time, the more calories you burn naturally just by sitting. So, you know, fascinating. So one thing that you tweet about quite often, Rel, is music. Yeah. Do you listen to music while you work? I don't. I'm a music fanatic, but I don't listen while I work. And I've been, my life, I, I can tell when I'm too busy because I don't listen to enough music. So, you know, I used to be discovering more new bands and discovering new music. I'm not getting that chance. Also, you get overwhelmed, like, like with Twitter or financial markets. There's too much. So, you know, with, with Spotify or I use Apple Music, there's too much music. I used to love having my racks of CDs and going through them, taking it out and listening to it. But now it kind of gets lost a little bit. So I find it harder. Um, but I, music has been the soundtrack to my life. And, you know, I love music, a very broad taste in music. So, yeah, it's very important to me. Yep, I used to have racks of CDs and I used to study the artwork and take out the booklets and read through them and I don't do any of those things anymore. There was a joy there was a real joy to that. I don't want to sound like a, you know, uh somebody who's totally out of touch, but there is a joy to that. It's like a joy to books. And of sure, I'll read stuff on Kindle, but there's something about holding a book or holding a CV, CD or or even a, an album cover, a full album and, you know, vinyl. So that's why vinyl came back into fashion as well. Raul, you mentioned Apple Music and Spotify there. Are there any apps or gadgets or tools that you really depend on or that you enjoy using? I don't, I try not to use too many apps. So, you know, for me, the, the one productivity app that I use is, is um, Evernote. Same here. I find that very useful to take notes and store stuff and keep streams of thoughts and that kind of stuff. I use it for preparing GMI. So Evernote is very useful to me. Um, and really I try not to use, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at the bottom of my screen now. I don't know. Let's check my phone. If there's anything I can think of that, that I find particularly useful apart from, you know, media that I consume, you know, I do use Apple TV. I'm a big Apple person. So Apple TV, Apple music, um, I do use, and then I am looking at anything else. No, I'm not a big app user. Do you keep a to-do list? Yes, always. Always. And structured in terms of long-term things I need to think about and get done over time that I may not be able to move forward now. Things that are on my current to-do list and then highlighted ones that are the things I need to get my arse into gear and get done or I really want to focus on. 
Right, because it does seem like you have a lot going on. I mean, we're recording this in July 2020, and you've just finished the first crypto gathering, which was a real marathon. I just wonder how you keep on top of everything. I got overwhelmed during that. Um, that was hard. Now, luckily, I didn't have to organize it. Shannon, who's incredibly organized, did that whole thing. But still, even with, I, you know, I did four or five interviews a day, plus I'm trying to run Real Vision, plus I'm trying to keep top of financial markets, plus social media, and I was exhausted after that. It went well, though, and you managed to keep everything running on time. Yeah, it went really well. We had some tech problems with uploading of videos, but otherwise it was a hell of an event. Really amazing. Yeah, I mean, I personally really enjoyed it. And I think it was the first time you put something like that together. And there was such a great lineup of guests. There was so much to learn there. Yeah, there's a lot of learning there. Right? That's what's so interesting about crypto is you have to learn because everything is new. So you can't have a, like a structured framework that you might use about economies or financial markets or even businesses. Everything is new. So it's really hard to stay on top of what's going on. So you need to probably unless you're a true polymath and you could absorb everything you kind of have to stick to some areas and say okay i'll kind of look into this raul you write a very popular newsletter are there any other newsletters or sources of information that you always make a point of reading i read very few people's information um purposely because it clouds my view i get everybody's views and i can see them from twitter and i'll occasionally read stuff of others um, the people I respect the most is Kirill Sokolov at 13D. Um, but there are other people that I read um, every week because I really trust them. They're succinct in how they write. People like Gerard Minak uh, from Minak Advisors, I'll read. I'll always read um, Albert Edwards just because I like his variant perception. But I tend not to read a lot of in-depth research um, just because I find... If I'm being paid, if people are basically, it's one of the most flashing things. People are basically paying for access to my thinking, to my mind. And that's flattering because this is some of the world's most famous hedge fund managers, you know, multi-billionaires. And they're paying me and call me up and say, what do you think? And so they're expecting from me some independent thought. If I'm reading everybody's research, I'm like, oh, that's a good point. He made that. I'm not doing my job. And I know a lot of other people do it that the other way of absorbing as much as possible. I don't. I, I think it's wrong and disingenuous to do so. Yeah, that makes sense. Raul, just getting back to health and fitness for a second. I know you mentioned yoga, but do you do anything else to keep fit? Um, yes, I mean, I walk a lot. Um, Walking is probably my favorite thing. So I've walked across the Sinai Desert. I've walked... Um, I've walked across the Sahara. I've walked... Um, in the Himalayas, I've walked you know the Pyrenees, and I've you know, done all of this. And I, so I love walking, hiking. I'm not massive mountain fan for walking. I actually prefer long. Flat, I love deserts actually. Um, so I do that, and even here on Little Cayman, you know, I take dogs out for a walk. You know, I do kind of sort of power walk stuff. So fast walking uh, for long periods of time for an hour or so, and I, I like that. Uh, I've, just, I've retaken up yoga again. I haven't done that for years, but um, um, just got a friend in Spain who uh, does yoga over Skype, so uh, over Zoom. So we do that um, every day. Well, I do it three times a week, um, and then um, I do um, go in and out of weight training. I don't do heavy weights. I do um, uh, more repetitions of lower weights, which I find su suits me and my structure. Um, and I go diving. Um, and that's that's basically it. Well, that's interesting. I think I read once that one of the books that influenced you early on was Jim Rogers' Investment Biker. Is that what got you started crossing deserts and so on? No, I, I lived in India as a kid. I my father took my parents took us to Morocco as kids. We went to India on holidays. We went to Holland on holidays. We travelled to Spain. Um, you know, before the mass tourism, we. Um, I, I had always been a traveler and loved it. And I also had this infatuation with Jacques Cousteau as a kid. So I always loved marine life and adventure. And I read people like Paul Theroux travel books massively. And still to this day, I'll, I'll read travel books. Um, so there was travel books, there was marine life, there was wildlife overall. So nature was a big part of it. 
Um, and so I spent a lot of time traveling. Um, never, I never took the long periods off because I was in the middle of a career, but I was the king of two week holidays. I mean, I would put together epic trips of, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd fly out to Hong Kong, spend a weekend with friends, then fly down to the Philippines, do a few islands in the Philippines, and then go for a week's diving in Palau in Micronesia all in two weeks. And so I did a lot of that. I did a lot of diving, particularly diving with sharks. So, you know, I spent a lot of time diving with uh, large amounts of sharks in the Galapagos, uh, the South Pacific, um, you know, cage diving great whites in South Africa, um, all the Red Sea, all over the world. Okay, here's a question, because obviously things have changed a lot over the last six months with the virus outbreak. Do you expect to be traveling like that again in future? Yeah, I think once, look, once this virus dies down, I will definitely travel. I've not, because Real Vision's kept me so busy, even a two-week holiday's been hard. Um, and my father was ill for many years, so I was going back and forth seeing my mum in Spain and kind of helping out. I mean, I, I have a passion for Spain, and I've got a place still in Spain, so, you know, I'm desperate to go back there. Yeah, same here. I love it too. I spent six months there as a student once in Granada. Oh, I love Granada. Gorgeous city. Um, I've got a place in uh, in Valencia, and um, my mum lives in a town called Javier, where, where I was living for 10 years. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've got, I'm desperate to go. I, I want to go and spend some time in Argentina. Um, I, I've still got a lot of Africa that I want to go get through. You know, I love the really remote places. So I, I want to get into the center of Africa. I spent a lot of time in West Africa. Um, Sierra Leone's high on my list of places. Um, I, for some reason, I've never made it to Lebanon either. So that's on my list. So there's a bunch of places I'm desperate to do, but I just need more time right now. So, so at some point, hopefully, I'll get more time to do more traveling. Just switching back to investing for a second, are you purely macro or do you ever invest in equities, in single stocks? Only if it's a macro-driven thing. So, for example, I, had, um, I owned a stock which was an Indian internet travel company uh, website, kind of like Expedia for India, um, called Make My Trip. I owned that for a while because it expressed a macro view, which is the massive rise of tourism in India, driven by the demographic population, driven by lower interest rates. So sometimes a single stock can be the pure expression of a view. Right now, for example, I'm short General Electric and um, AT&T because they are the best expression amongst some other positions around it of what I think is a potential solvency event. So yes, I do do single stocks, but I'm, I'm not the guy who finds this amazing company that, you know, looks at the balance sheet and says, okay, this is, you know, I think this is underpriced. That's not my skill set. Do you remember your first multi-bagger? I remember my first losses. That's always easy. Um, my first multi, well, it was running the hedge fund at GLG. I bought some three days to expiration Cosby put options. I don't know why I did that, but I thought, it looked an interesting bet, and the Cosby collapsed overnight, made twelve hundred percent return on that, um, because the time horizon was so short. There's so much gamma in the trade. Yeah, so that that's interesting. Um, but there's been a number of those themes that I've stuck with for many years, um, whether it's been the U.S. dollar, whether it's been India, whether it's been cryptocurrencies, whether it's been commodities at various points. You know, there's been a lot of these trades. And I think I know the answer to this one already, but are there any themes in particular which you think people ought to keep an eye on now? Well, obviously, obviously, the whole digital asset space is, is the biggest thing I've ever seen. Um, I think that's important. I think that Mark Andreessen's The Software is Eating the World continues. I think the other trend, and I'm slightly biased, but I know it's true, is video is playing a big part of that software eating the world. Okay. Mral, one last question to close, if that's okay with you. Sure. And this is one that we've kind of stolen from someone that you know, Tim Ferriss. And that's, in the last five years, is there any new belief, behavior, or habit which has had an impact on you or improved your life? Keto is one of them. Um, that was, that's, one of, that's probably the biggest change in just how I live my life over the last five years. Uh, I would say, and this came from Tim Ferriss too, Evernote, that's really helpful. 
um, just to keep organized on top of stuff. So um, there's another thing. I forgot another app because I'm not traveling. Is Trip It. Trip It. God, changed my life. You just send your travel schedule to plans at tripit.com. It populates it, tells when your flight is, tells you if it's late. You've got all the information you need, and you see all your schedule. You used to travel a lot. Um, so there's a bit of productivity that I think has helped improve my life. And actually, you know, I did get a lot of that from Tim. Um, and Keto is the other one. All right. Well, we've covered a lot of interesting ground there. Raul, thanks again for taking the time to speak with us today. No, I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, not at all. Good to speak to you. And you. Thanks. All right. Take care. So there you have it. A little bit of insight into how Raul works. You can find Raul at realvision.com or on Twitter at RaulGMI. You can find links to both of these in the show notes. We'll be back soon with another episode, but until then, if you're looking either to hire or be hired in Zurich, let us know by visiting either rigby.ch forward slash apply for general applications or opportunities.rigby.ch for some of the requirements that we currently have open. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, please help us spread the word by taking a moment to rate and review The Way I Work podcast in the iTunes store. It really does help. Thanks and until the next time.